But when I pushed to production, things didn't go exactly as planned. Look, the unfortunate reality is that as software engineers, there's going to be times where we're fixing bugs based on stack traces from production. It's not something we want to happen, but it's basically inevitable. Even if we test as much as we possibly can, all of those tests are supposed to help us have confidence in our changes, but we can't possibly prevent every possible bug that could occur. So in this video, I wanted to walk you through me problem solving and fixing bugs and real production code that I have based on a stack trace that I had from production. I'm gonna show you how I use the information from the trace to find where the problem in the code was, diagnose why that problem happened, fix it, and then write some tests to help cover it. And stay right to the end so you can see how things finally went when I pushed the prod. A friendly reminder to check that pinned comment for my free weekly newsletter. And with that, let's check out this stack trace. All right, on my screen, I have the stack trace that I found in production when this error was occurring. And for some context, the situation is that I was having a customer do a password reset on their account because they couldn't log in because they just couldn't remember their password. And the exception that we see in the stack trace here, I just missed the eye on invalid operation exception, is telling us that we have a nullable object that we were trying to get the value from. And in my opinion, this is equally as crappy as coming across a null reference exception. It's technically almost the exact same thing, just a slightly different situation because we have a nullable object. And if I look at the stack trace, I can see that it makes sense where the issue is coming from because I have some type of service for authentication. In this case, I'm using Cognito from AWS. And if we think about the password resetting part, that's going to have to interact with Cognito at some point to manage where that password is. And the last little tip that we get from the stack trace is that it's on line 239. So line 239 in Cognito authentication service, that's the first spot that I think we want to go check out. All right, in my project, I have this notification client inside of the Cognito authentication service. And I've gone to line 239, like the stack trace said, and you can see that when we write code across multiple lines like this, it's technically telling us that everything that you're seeing here is still on line 239. Now, when I'm debugging null reference exceptions like this, and I have a bunch of code that's technically going to line up against line 239, because everything that you're seeing here is going to classify still as line 239, I have to start walking through which things can be null. Now, parameters, just because I have it on my screen right here, if I scroll up a little bit higher, I can see parameters is coming from, oh, something that's passed in. So this could potentially be null, but let's scroll back down and see what else at line 239 could be null. One that looks very interesting is this get user ID for email result because we're getting the value off of it. And you'll notice that I'm using this bang operator, which is supposed to say, hey, look, we know that everything coming back that we're using at this point cannot be null. Therefore, we're able to grab the value off. Without this bang operator, we get a warning from Visual Studio that's going to tell us, hey, look, this thing could potentially be null. But there's some situations where we might have more context than the compiler. And in those cases, we can insert that bang operator to let it know that we can guarantee it's not gonna be null. But what if it could be null in this case? What if I screwed that up? To me, this is potentially more likely the culprit. I'm not saying that parameters could not be null, but I do wanna go investigate this one because it seems a little bit suspicious that I've made the claim that I'm guaranteeing it's not null. I mean, I haven't looked at this code in a little while and I can't obviously tell why I should be able to guarantee that it's not null. So let's go back to where we're getting this variable and I can see that I'm calling try get user ID for email asynchronously. And we're passing in the email and a cancellation token. So if I jump into this method now, I can see that, oh, wait a second. I have this return type that's a task because it's asynchronous, but I'm using this result type that I built. And the goal of it is to be able to package up exceptions as well as a return type. And this way I don't need to wrap a try catch around everything, but instead I can try executing things and ensure that I can check the exception if one occurs. But there's something really interesting about this because the flavor of this result type that I chose looks like it's allowing nullable types. In fact, it's allowing null right here. The other variation I have of this is just tried x, not tried null x. So that's really interesting that I made a claim in the other method, the result of this could never be null. When in fact, if we look at the signature, it's literally telling us that you can expect null to come back. I think we're onto something. I think that there's a bug in the other spot where I'm assuming that it can never be null. So we'll scroll down a little bit and see what this method's doing. I'm not gonna go through all the details of exactly what's happening under the hood, but we're essentially fetching users from a repository with a filter. And we can see that if we have one user, great, we'll return it. 
If we have multiple, we're going to throw an exception because this is an exceptional case. This should never happen in reality, and it tells us that part of our system's broken. But interestingly enough, on line 894, we can see that it is going to return a null. Bingo. This has got to be the spot. We have this null return value that can come back, and the other part of our code that lines up on line 239 is telling us that we should never expect null. I think we have to go back and properly handle that null instead of just assuming that it will never be null. Now, I've already fixed this, but I've gone back in my Git history to show you what's on the screen here, and I'm about to go check out the other spot that has the commit so I can show you the additional code. So what we're about to observe is that I have another if statement that's going to come in right after this. And with the fix checked out, you can see that on line 221 that I've added in this additional if. And what I'm doing is saying it doesn't matter if this was successful or not, because that was the only condition I checked before. So we were only looking for exceptional cases. But what we're doing here now is saying if it's null, which was totally valid and not exceptional, but we're going to write out a debug log. And this isn't something that I'm going to keep in production for long. I just want to make sure that when I'm working with this user to ensure that everything's valid, that if something weird is going on, I can still see what's up. But before I scroll down to where the other code was originally on line 239, I just want to call out that I'm now pulling out the user ID and I'm able to do that right from here. And what you might observe, and it might be not obvious, is that I don't have that bang operator here right after value. So there's no bang operator, but Visual Studio is also telling me that it knows that I don't need it. It knows that user ID is never going to be null. And it knows that because I'm doing this null check explicitly here. So this is a friendly reminder that when you're seeing warnings, you probably want to take them very seriously. There's a lot of times where we do know better than the compiler, but there's many times where the compiler truly knows better than us. So I'm pulling that user ID out without the bang operator now, and I'm able to go use that back down below right in here in the notification client. So this is great. I believe at this point now I've fixed the bug, but we're not done because we need tests. So one of the reasons that there was an escape here was not because I had bad tests in place, but because I didn't have any tests in place on this code. And I'm not saying that if I had a bunch of tests that I obviously would have caught this issue, but the reality is I don't have any tests on it at all. Within that class, many of the other methods are tested, but this particular one for resetting passwords just didn't have any test coverage on it. And an important thing I want to call out about the tests we can write on this is that, in my opinion, they are best served by being unit tests. And what I mean by unit tests is being able to have the external systems, in this case, the Cognito service from AWS, totally abstracted away, and I'm not going to be interfacing with it. And that's because I don't want to be interfacing with the internet with a production service for my tests. Now, I didn't scroll through all of the code in that class, but this is a situation where I have a class that has over a thousand lines of code. It's way too big, and it makes it really difficult to test all of it in a really clear way. It's probably a really good opportunity at this point to go back and refactor it and clean it up, split it into smaller things. I just haven't done that yet. And what you're going to notice is that we go back to the test code, you're going to see that I'm in the thousands of lines in the test code as well. And again, to make it more easy to navigate and understand, it's probably a great opportunity for me to split all of this up, have the dedicated tests for the different parts also split up as well. But for right this moment, I don't want to couple all of that refactoring to go split up that class and add the tests into my same commit. And that can follow later. But I want to focus on fixing this bug so I can help my customer, and I'm going to add the test coverage to ensure I have confidence in this change. Afterwards, if I have time, I can go back and clean this up to make it more easy for me to navigate the next time. Because odds are, if I'm having a couple of bugs right now in some of my authentication code, I want to go make that feel really good to navigate for the future, so all the bugs I have to fix can be way easier. Let's go check out the tests. All right, so on line 1179, yes, over a thousand lines of code in this test file, I've added one new test, which is going to check if an existing single user for the email is there, and if so, will return true when trying to reset the password. I am using mock to set up the mocks in this case, and then I have some parameters that I'm also setting up ahead of time. The details of setting up these various mocks that you see on my screen aren't super important, but I wanted to show you that I am having a scenario where I'm covering that I have one user that exists for the email, and that's one happy path scenario that I would have wanted to cover before. Now, the reality is that to make sure that this is working as expected, I need to guarantee that I have a code path where the user doesn't exist. 
That's what the whole problem was in the first place where we were getting that null coming back. So to quickly show you on the mock that I'm setting up, when I'm asking to get the users based on a filter, I'm going to return back an empty array of users. You'll also see that I am mocking out my logging. I want to make sure that my logging is configured properly and that if that scenario is going to get hit, that I do get that debug log printed out. And when I do call this method with everything set up the way it is, with that empty array coming back, I should get a false value coming back as well. So at this point, I have fixed the code and I have added two tests. The first test is going to be the happy path that I would have expected. And the second test is that negative path, the path that was causing me to have a code breakage. And I'm now proving that with that path set up, I'm getting the expected behavior. From here, I'm ready to push to production. I have my test coverage and I have the fix that I think is ready to go. And once that's up there, I can sit down with the customer again and say, hey, try resetting your password. I got everything fixed up and you should be able to log in after you get that password reset. But when I pushed a production, things didn't go exactly as planned. So when the next video is ready, you can go ahead and watch that right here to see what happened. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.